Um, and with that, I'm, I'd like to um, now introduce uh, Joe Borwick from uh, NYSERDA, hence NYSERDA, one of, one of our, our sponsors for, for this event. Uh, Joe's well, well known, I think, to man, many of you here. He's a program manager in the Buildings Research and Development Program at NYSERDA. Been with NYSERDA almost 10 years, and previously was with uh, GE Corporate um, R&D in uh, Niski Una. Uh, had a career of more than 20 years at, at GE in the lighting group. Uh, and Joe's, uh, Joe holds more than, Joe holds 21 patents. Uh, with uh, with GE and lighting, um, and uh, it's uh, it's great great to have Joe here. I invite Joe to share a few comments. Thank you, Ed. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, when we were approached to be a sponsor uh, of this uh, event, and we were told that the subject would be advanced building systems focus on energy efficiency, quality, and resiliency, uh, it was an easy yes for us to uh, be a sponsor for this event. And the reason is, in New York, we have a goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by the year 2030. And if you look at buildings, buildings use 62% of the energy in New York State and contribute to 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions. And if you take New York City alone, right, buildings contribute 80% of greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, in order to achieve this goal, right, we need to focus on making buildings more energy efficient. And the other challenge is, because we, you know, New York has, you know, was one of the <coughs> earlier states, the 80% of the buildings in New York State were built be, be, before the first oil embargo of the, of the 70s. So we have this large stock of very in, uh, inefficient buildings that we need to get up to code, you know, to be more energy efficient. So there are a lot of challenges in front of us. And I think a lot of the work that's you know, going to be presented here is going to help towards that, those goals. And hopefully this will also stimulate new ideas here. And um, we are a funding agency, so you know, if there's a good idea, we would be willing to hear it and, and possibly fund the idea. So thank you. Enjoy the conference. And all the best. Here that when we sent out months ago a uh, save the date notice for uh, for the event, the very first person to say, "What can I do to help?" was Joe Borwick. So thanks, thanks to Joe. It's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Bess Kriedemeyer, an assistant professor in Syracuse University School of Architecture. Um, Bess joined Syracuse University a year ago. Uh, she teaches studios and technical courses emphasizing environmental performance within architectural design. Uh, Bess earned her PhD from RPI um, at, uh, at the Center for Architecture, Science, and Ecology. Uh, Bess also served as co-chair of the program committee for the symposium. Bess? Thank you. Well, welcome and thanks to everyone for joining us on the second day of this, this symposium, the COE symposium. It's my great pr pleasure and privilege to be able to introduce you to our opening keynote speaker, Anna Dyson. Anna is a professor in the School of Architecture at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, where she teaches design, technology, and theory. She's the founding director of the Center for Architecture, Science, and Ecology, also known as CASE, which was established in 2007 <coughs> and hosts the graduate program in architectural sciences at Rensselaer. CASE is a multi-institutional and professional office research collaboration focused on next generation building technologies for sustainable built environments. Co-hosted by RPI and Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, CASE is testing the boundaries of environmental performance in urban building systems on a global scale using actual building projects as test beds. <coughs> Through Anna's leadership, CASE has been recognized for scholarship, including multiple awards by the AIA, Acadia, U.S. Green Building Council, the Wholesome Foundation, the Buckminster Fuller Foundation, SPARC, the National Building Museum, and others. Anna's urban design work has been exhibited internationally at venues including the Museum of Modern Art, the World Future Energy Summit, the Center for Architecture, and the Postmasters Gallery. Anna holds multiple international patents for building systems inventions, 
and has directed interdisciplinary design research funded by the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Department of Energy, the Environmental Protection Agency, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, and the New York State Foundation for Science, Technology, and Innovation. She's collaborated with the COE on multiple fronts, including an installation testbed of the integrated concentrating solar facade, which is installed in the COE High Bay space. Anna is a brilliant individual, a fearless leader in the field, and an inspiring colleague and friend. I should also mention that she was my PhD advisor while I was conducting my doctoral work at Case. Her input was invaluable then, and it continues to be, as I have the honor and the privilege of continuing to collaborate with her now. In this morning's keynote, titled From Built Ecologies to Built, Eco Built Environments to Built Ecologies, Anna will discuss the environmental challenges that face decision makers within building industries and present research that seeks to harness the ecological energetics towards more biocompatible building systems. It's my great pleasure to have her here with us today, so please join me in welcoming Anna Dyson. Well, I have to say, it couldn't be more humbling than to follow my, my former advising and student, Bess Meyer, who is just, um, I have to say, just a, as an opening, our students at Case really are um, the people who inspire us for the future and are just incredibly um, moving in terms of the way that they are fearlessly bringing us into the next generation um, uh, for uh, problems that we probably could not have envisaged when we were students. Um, so the world is incredibly complex, and um, it's always been complex, but I think we're getting to a point where we're recognizing how we have to take on that complexity in, in new ways. So a case, um, just as a note um, to what we are really doing, uh, it's, um, it started as um, an idea for uh, translational research or tech transfer research from emerging discoveries in the lab in science and engineering, and an idea that we could um, more um, quickly uh, translate those or apply those into building systems. Um, typically, the gestation period takes about 20 years <laughs> for really transformative um, uh, research to make its way into building systems or, or longer, and um, we were impatient with a lot of the so-called efficiencies, especially in green technologies, or the sort of minimal impact that we were seeing in terms of the overall built environment or built ecology, if you will, or the behavior, whole building matrix, energy systems, or air quality, et cetera. And uh, so it's really coming from um, building uh, design professionals that were in charge of delivering the building, um, i.e. those building architects and engineers that had to sign off on all the systems, um, regardless of how well they were considered or um, how well they were performing. Um, and uh, I, so on that note, I would say that cases really transitioned. Um, Due to the work of Bess and others, um, we've really transitioned into what we would consider to be fundamental research in integrated building systems uh, that looks at the relationship between material uh, scale behavior, um, device level, and integrated systems behavior in a fundamentally new way. So what we realized is that we will just um, be repeating a lot of the mistakes of um, uh, prior um, uh, building research if we would attempt to think about um, uh, developing systems in isolation from the ecology of all of the different behaviors of, of the building. So trying to manage the intersection and the complexities between um, different areas is really what we've come to specialize in. And in that way, um, even though we say that we have different um, areas of research up here, we would say, well, we have high performance um, uh, ceramics research, we have um, uh, research into um, water recuperation systems, we have research into on-site net, um, uh, on-site energy generation. In essence, what we're really doing is looking at the intersection between those systems for um, the um, various um, systems. And just to, um, you know, as a kind of provocation, um, we would say that one of the most important things is really tr um, uh, to, as much as possible, transition our built environments towards on-site net zero in real time. And so what we're talking about really is um, relationships between district scale strategies um, that are going to um, extract energy from ambient resources in different ways and look at the relationship between those sources. So whether or not they're coming from solar energy, from ground sources, from 
um, uh, tidal sources, from wind sources. There's energy in our environment, and we are very far away from being able to know how to optimally or um, uh, efficiently extract those energy flows. So the idea is not to say, well, how much can we do with this turbine, or how, can, how much can we do with that solar panel, but really look at some of these um, energy flows fundamentally and look at what we really need um, to, to, to do in the building environment and how can we deliver the bottom line. And the bottom line is basically heating, lighting, cooling, plug loads, and, and fresh air, good air quality, um, and um, a, a sort of inspiring place to be in terms of health and well-being and cultural aspirations. And so what do, who do we need to do this? And this, um, some of you will recognize this very provocative uh, diagram that never made it into our New York State Energy Hub. However, it was a point of discussion about um, what our relationships would be between really important partners. Syracuse was, was leading our, our Energy Hub team, and, and I was reminded of that in being invited to come back here. So I just want to thank you so much for inviting me back. And um, just to say that we still have the same problem as ever is, um, you know, I was very inspired um, in uh, like long-term relationships with folks like Ez Khalifa and Ed Bogish about their, um, you know, insistence that this was a multi-scalar problem and that and we had to involve multiple stakeholders across the process simultaneously. We really had to create a web of interaction and um, and discourse, and so that. Um, folks that really understood certain aspects about social impediments, economic impediments, financial tools, et cetera, had to really be within the discussion from the beginning. And that it wouldn't be the classical um, uh, platform, NSF <coughs> platform, where we have sort of thinking of fundamental research as being the materials, um, innovations, and then looking at the enabling technologies and then applications as a kind of sequential flow, but really getting the discussion um, started across all of us at the inception. And just you know, to zoom out a little bit into really what we're doing in architecture and what we've been doing for centuries is we're basically reshaping energy flows we're re and we're reforming molecules. And so at a fundamental level, we've always had to deal with the relationship between um, solar energy flows, bioclimatic flows in, um, in, in, in the airflow and the basic quality um, and quantities um, that are going to be um, exchanged with very low potentials in the environment. And then if we zoom way out into what kind of environments that gives us and what are the impacts of those environments, we're really talking about a massive degree of change and chemical change in the environment that is, a, that is affecting us. So a case what we're looking at really is if we take uh, built, uh, built environments as a whole, what kind of ecology have we created, and how and why do we spend a lot of our energy um, in buildings today? We spend an extraordinary amount of energy, for instance, delivering um, uh, what we would consider to be adequate air quality at the temperature and um, in, in the places that we need it, um, without really actually looking at the ecology of, uh, as a whole and looking how we can manage those aspects in relationship to other types of energy. If we look at this from a different standpoint and say, um, what are we actually doing in terms of changing the energy condition at the, the municipal scale, um, and then zooming out to regional, we're looking at, um, in a sense, how we have created tremendous problems of energy concentration that is then not extractable or usable by our systems. So what we are going to say, um, uh, and, and, and I'm going to provoke here, is that certain things that have been considered problems within urban environments and buildings, such as, let's say, low-grade heat, um, or let's say airflow that we cannot figure out how to redirect or extract energy from, these are the sort of low potentials and low differentials between um, energy flows that we have to figure out in built ecologies how to redirect and how to usably and viably um, capitalize on. And that's really what we're focusing on in that case. And, and then if we go back in history, we can see that working even in, with very complex ecologies as per New York City, let's say in the 19th century, um, there was still uh, the understanding within policy and within building codes of minimal relationships between airflow and um, for instance, solar gain and light quality, and that we have to work simultaneously. And this is one of the things that um, I'm going to sort of provoke is that as we're in the lab and the various labs, and as we're um, developing the and um, um, moving forward the engineering on these technologies, we have to work closely with um, those folks that will help us 
um, uh, enable our discoveries to shift the building codes so towards um, and back to, in a way, it's a back to the future thing, which means that we'll, we'll never get away from the fact that we have to work with ambient energy flows within our built environment. And the most important thing that we can do is really work with policy to make sure that the basic fundamental conditions of urban morphology and building morphology are amenable to the capture of ambient energy flows. So just looking at this from, I'm going to start actually with the issue of just air quality and then um, I'm going to take us through very um, um, quickly some numbers, some basic numbers on um, uh, uh, capitalizing on solar energy flows and then loop back to show how um, these things are um, completely interdependent in, in terms of the way that we're looking at them. So um, at CASE, um, this multiscalar phenomenon is absolutely critical. And what we do basically is look at, um, if we zoom out and look at the um, urban condition, as an example, we are associated with the NICAS index in New York um, and New York City, and looking at the conditions of air quality and urban morphology. And this then is drawn in um, at multiple scales and analyzed um, at different sc scales by different um, entities. But ultimately, the bottom line is on the right-hand side here. The bottom line is, what is the interface with the conditions of air that we have? And there's emerging data that shows that policies will have to shift enormously, once again, in the way that they did. Um, let's say um, we went through a phase um, sort of when uh, in 1962 or the mid uh, uh, 20th century where there was a real push to allow for these very deep floor plates and to allow for um, building typologies that could not, um, that, that did um, not, uh, were not able to fall back on uh, the basic access of distributed um, fresh air. Um, then we had, we, we, we went through a phase um, where um, we, sick buildings started to emerge and in the early 80s, the, 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 the po policy started to shift towards servicing these very deep floor plates, such as the one that we're in right now, um, towards um, uh, um, increasing the amount of exterior fresh air intake that we, um, that we get into our buildings. The issue with that, and the basic issue now, is that we have emerging data from biotechnology and from genome sequencing and from um, the, uh, the analysis of the built environment um, that we are actually, it wouldn't matter how much fresh air intake we have, if we have the SUV of HVAC systems, let's say in a hospital um, condition, uh, where we have 100% exterior air, air intake, we're basically also, we're, we're filtering out the bad, so we're taking um, some toxins out, but we are also filtering out the good. That means that we are reducing the biodiversity on the inside of our buildings, and we are lowering our immunity. So this is an example of how we're getting exponential data, and it really is a kind of Moore's Law condition. This data comes from biomedical, and it comes from uh, biotechnology uh, and research um, into microbiomes and human microbiomes. And the relationship, really, between the microbiome within even the human gut, certainly uh, the lungs, uh, the skin, et cetera, is intric intricately related to the kind of microbiome that we um, uh, provide within our buildings and in our urban environments. And obviously, this is going to be very far away from the kind of biodiversity of air quality that is in our forests or in our in, in, in uh, so-called natural environments that are not compromised or not, are not reduced. So the idea of what is fresh air is completely shifting, literally um, before our eyes um, as this data it emerges. And really, it leads to another type of revolution in our view, which basically says that we are not able, literally, to go anywhere um, in terms of saying that we're going to get away from poor air quality, for instance, in built environments. And we're also really not able to, to um, divorce ourselves from the outside. So this whole idea of interior and exterior and what that building envelope needs to do in terms of an interface with ecologies um, is really shifting now. And the idea that we can really separate the conditions from interior and exterior and that that would be good for the end goal, which is basically human vitality, um, has really changed. And so um, on the left-hand side, we see a number of different indices. Um, we see from data taken from, let's say, interior air, air samples um, are all the way on the upper left where we have very, very low uh, biodiversity and very, very elevated pathogens. 
Um, so we see that we are actually sterilizing and ultimately our environments are so-called antibiotic. Um, and we know what that happens when you take an antibiotic pill, what that does to your gut. Most people are aware of that kind of information now within the last uh, decade. Um, the emergence of information and the proliferation of information in our urban and built environments will now indicate to us that we are also creating these kinds of sterilized or antibiotic environments um, in general. So what we're breathing right now, we're breathing human microbiome. Um, microbiota. So that is something to think about in terms of why people get sick in interior environments. We, we of course, we have psychometric profile issues and we have other um, issues in the relationship between humidity and temperature, but it's much more complex than that. And why do I start with that? Because basically, um, this is the, the hypothesis in the idea of a shift from built environments to built ecologies. Ultimately, um, let's say for the last hundred years at least, or the you know, predominance of the mechanical era, we thought of built environments as, um, as creating boundaries and separations that were really um, very different from the way that we're going to have to think about boundaries and separations in the future. So if built environments are basically looking at these conditions on the left-hand side as um, you know, we're sort of visualizing what our area of inquiry or our uh, point of interest is, on the right-hand side, um, we're starting to think if we are going to capitalize on ambient energy flows, if we are going to capitalize on good, healthy, biodiverse air that is on the outside but not on the inside, we are going to shift basically from building envelopes that are um, um, dealing with temperature flows and air flows in very, very different ways. Firstly, we're going to have to distribute and we're going to have to redistribute airflow. Also, we're going to have to think about how do we absorb um, transform, redirect, store, and then uh, distribute energy flows and air flows in, um, in, in, in the right way. So what does that mean um, um, as a polemic? Um, on, on the top of the slide, you can see the idea of conventional building envelopes and how they're conceived of dealing with temperature flows um, or air flows. We basically have the idea of max minimizing entry production or maximizing insulation um, on the black arrow, if you can't read this, I'm sorry, it's a little bit fuzzy, I'm now seeing on these slides, I apologize for that. Um, the, um, on, on the black arrow is really showing the fossil, we, we're, that we're driving um, our systems with fossil fuels, with basically dirty energy um, uh, uh, sources, and um, they're extremely inefficient, of course, both um, at the regional district and building scale in terms of the losses. We're trying to minimize the losses of energy um, and we're basically trying to fight the bioclimatic energy flows in the green that are, uh, and, and we're trying to basically impede their passage across the building envelope. What we would say is that we would like to transition from that <coughs> idea of a boundary condition at the building envelope um, that is impeding flows or in minimizing entropy, uh, minimizing losses, and look at maximally absorbing. So on the bottom, what you see there is actually the capture, and we even consider pollutants as inputs, because they can be inputs if we reform those molecules through um, uh, biotechnological systems, and we're basically processing the air in a different way. So if we're capturing, transforming, storing, and redistributing those energy flows, then um, uh, it's a very, very different type of building envelope. We're talking about moving from um, this boundary to basically a transfer function condition. And so, you know, one would say, well, we don't have enough ambient energy to really do anything with. Um, of course, we know that's not true. What we don't have is systems that know how to adequately convert those energy flows and redistribute them in time um, uh, where we need them. So we can see this relationship between the capture, transformation, and storage and distribution of energy, and then with the um, actual programmatic requirements that we have on the bottom, the hourly <coughs> programmatic requirements. So the idea is, how do you basically look at, um, at uh, parallel tracking and um, matching a fluctuating ambient energy condition um, with bioclimatic energy flows, um, which basically the bio can also obviously mean us, what we produce from the interior, and how could we recapture, for instance, um, heat and other low-grade sources and make them valuable. Um, and then looking at the, 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 the demand. They're obviously not in sync, um, we know that, and so this is why, of course, the storage piece and, uh, the, con and the transformation piece um, is so important. The low-grade energy flows are coming at our building envelope um, in quantities and qualities that are not adequate for matching. The other thing, of course, we know is that the 
ability for our building envelopes um, to um, interface with the building envelope will, uh, with, with uh, energy, ambient energy flows is really dependent on the morphology, the condition, the climate, and we have decreasing opportunities as we start to scale up. Um, so if we look really obviously on the left-hand side, um, we've got envelope-dominated buildings. Um, uh, once we start getting into that mid-zone, we're in danger of not having enough square footage or enough um, area. Of, um, of, of really being able to um, adequately capture and transfer. And this is why we're so focused at CASE basically on um, maximizing and valuing those very small potentials um, of difference um, in energy in terms of delivering what we need. And in the context, let's say, of energy systems, um, clearly this context is completely conceived of as being separate from what we really need within built and urban environments and um, conceived as single function systems. We happened, I'm gonna show you um, a system where we actually are, our, our, um, our licensees at Helioptics are, have signed a co-development agreement um, for a new co with Aminex, who is actually the world record holder um, uh, for a, an integrated concentrating system um, for the large array that they have out in Colorado. And so they've achieved very high efficiencies for integrated systems, but integrated to do what? Produce electricity only. And I'll show in a minute that electricity is actually a very small, it could be a very much smaller piece of the story on buildings um, than it needs to be. Um, so what we're gonna, what I'm gonna propose, I'll focus on a system that um, uh, we have a visual mock-up here at um, Syracuse from 2009. And uh, we were uh, here for uh, quite a while taking some, some data and we've sort of moved um, beyond that. Um, uh, over the years we've uh, been um, uh, testing very, um, diligently for many years, and I'm excited to show my, my friends at Syracuse and everyone else in the audience uh, our recent data. Um, but our provocation is basically that we can get to district scale size installations with many of the building types that we have already. And we can get to peer to peer sharing um, with um, uh, uh, very high efficiency systems. But the important thing is to capitalize on the whole solar spectrum and to really match the resource with um, the requirements. Um, so before we get to the next gen, I just want to um, start with where we're at today with systems. So this is, the, this is our uh, project in Staten Island, and I believe it will be the first institutional building that is truly on-site net zero, uh, uh, um, using existing systems. Um, and of course, um, uh, we have a very, very large, uh, expansive PV that's required to take this building off the grid with the constraints, let's say, of the Department of Education in New York City today not a viable condition really for um, all of New York City and not a prototype for the Department of Education, but a point of departure to get everybody to understand what would it really take to um, power a building um, uh, completely um, using existing technologies. Unfortunately, um, with this, the, 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 the opportunities that we had with this um, project, I mean, you can see this was the very first um, uh, visualization of the project um, that won the competition in initially with um, uh, our, our consultant partners um, who were um, basically projecting uh, what they would uh, need in order in terms of an expansive PV to deliver all of the systems. It ended up looking like the first um, slide which is basically once we did the auditing on the numbers for the various consultants in lighting and solar and mechanical systems etc. Um, we basically um, reported back that, um, at case, reported back that they would need twice the amount if they were not going to basically combine their systems with um, um, uh, hot water systems and other um, uh, uh, um, methods. So to get to really what they needed with, um, with electrical producing systems only, it required a massive amount of square footage. And what do we do when we're in New York City, as Joe mentioned, or in other uh, environments where we have pretty much the majority of what we see in front of us today is what we will have in 2030. We're really talking about retrofitting existing buildings with <coughs> largely vertical opportunities for um, uh, uh, acquisition. Uh, sometimes we're self-shaded or we're shaded um, by other buildings, et cetera. And so how do we really look at those morphologies and those conditions and acquire and match the loads um, with the ambient resources. Definitely, obviously cannot do it with um, single function systems alone. Um, the, the, the main thing, and I apologize, we've got a kind of um, a layer there, but what this is basically showing is um, how other technologies and synergistic technologies are looking at pairing basically the transfer, the capture and transfer of 
um, of heat energy and moving it through uh, buildings in order to balance out um, uh, certain requirements um, for domestic hot water and or um, uh, uh, ambient um, temperatures. Um, today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on why um, we can get towards on-site net zero by basically layering and combining um, uh, strategies um, that are, are going to um, uh, address the whole energy spectrum. And we have several systems that are in development, um, some of which are associated with New York State funding. Um, uh, on the far right is climate, climate camouflage. It's an eco-ceramic system with PCM batteries and um, a redistribution um, through hydronics. Uh, we also have solar enclosure for water reuse, um, um, using optical um, means to um, uh, basically uh, look at the <coughs> purification of gray water cycles. Um, more appropriate in that case for hot area climates. We also, what I'm not going to show today is um, we have hydrogel systems where we're looking at capturing the ambient um, uh, humidity out of the air and delivering for potable water as well, and obviously um, uh, dramatically lowering cooling loads going into either conventional or next-gen HVAC systems. But what I'm going to concentrate is on, um, um, I'm going to focus on is on the left-hand side, which is the integrated concentrating solar facade where we're really looking at combined heat and power. And what we say is no photon, no le electron wasted, really trying to capitalize on the direct beam and the diffuse beam for daylighting um, in different ways and um, spreading daylighting, but also really transforming the quality of the energy so that we can drive systems with both um, heat and power. So if we look at the building envelope and we look at the, the climatic energy potentials, um, really there's so much um, within buildings that we can do with low potentials and the exchanging of low potentials. We don't need to, be, um, to um, power our systems um, as we saw with the Zero Energy School in Staten Island, um, starting with electricity. Um, that would be a very, um, uh, in a sense, costly and wasteful way to redirect the energy flows. And so what we're looking at is um, capitalizing on energy at um, um, throughout its sort of cascaded spectrum. Um, and we're looking at um, here, um, not just obviously, um, uh, when we're looking at the building envelopes, we're not looking just at solar energy. We're obviously looking at redirecting airflow for multiple reasons as well. Um, but just bearing that in mind, and then going into what the, the, the sort of concept to do or where we're headed with this, is with current systems, you can see on the left, if, you're, if we're just looking at single function systems, um, sorry, with current systems um, uh, that are powered by fossil fuels, so basically what we saw in the black arrow um, from the previous slide, we're looking at um, tremendous um, uh, 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 inputs of energy, of concentrated energy for centralized systems. Um, what we're looking at is decentralizing these systems and changing the potentials uh, sorry, changing the, 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 the quality of the energy to capitalize on potentials in a distributed fashion throughout the building. And with the, the, the system that I'm going to show, basically, um, we can see that, yes, there are different opportunities, let's say, in different direct solar climates. Assuming we agree that New York City is a direct solar climate, maybe not Syracuse, maybe we're not talking about Troy or Syracuse, but we're talking about New York City or other areas of New York State. Um, certainly, if you're looking at the solar resource that you have in Phoenix, or in a place like Mountain View, um, you're looking at really surpluses um, if you're converting um, the entire spectrum with uh, standard um, uh, base case models, DOE base case models. In this case, we're going to take the base case model of just a, a sort of medium-sized commercial building. Um, so in New York City, with that, uh, um, that uh, base case model, we are looking at still having, you can see with an active facade and with converting as much of the square footage that we would have at our disposal, we still have a little bit of um, um, uh, help that we need um, uh, from another energy source. But if you would imagine, for instance, where wind energy is going, maybe wind energy or other types of ambient energies are only going to shave fractions or reduce peak load, et cetera but we could potentially bump up with those very um, uh, sort of emergent and, um, and sort of nascent technologies that are still not giving us much, but if we're, we're taking care of our loads and able to store them enough um, at, at the district scale with solar, we're, we're almost there at on-site net zero right in New York City. Um, and just a, a, a quick um, uh, uh, context, what do we use um, our, um, our, our, what do we use electricity for in buildings today? So we're looking at a massive amount of electricity use um, for uh, different um, uh, applications. Um, 
But, and, and, and how do we use that? So if we look at really the demands of the built environment, what do we need? We would say good lighting, we put that at the highest priority. Electricity for, because you gotta light the building, right? You gotta be able to move around. Um, and as we saw with Hurricane Sandy, that was not easy in those deep floor plate buildings. Um, uh, and at Case, we both live and work in those types of buildings. So we're very familiar with those problems. <laughs> uh, we're walking around with flashlights in the middle of the building for two weeks. So, um, but then we get to electricity for equipment. So let's say we have to supply um, lighting um, throughout the building. We have uh, electricity for, uh, for equipment. Then we start to get into humidity control, cooling and heating. And really, the quality of the energy that we need for those, um, uh, those uh, bottom run um, uh, 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 applications is, 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 is really very low if, if, we, um, if we're able to transform just um, uh, at not very much. So what we do today with grid concentrated resources, right? Um, we're basically using fossil fuels we're putting it through grid power towards electric light. Then we're starting to also downgrade into those other applications in a very, very needless way. And what happens, obviously we're all familiar with this, but what this um, uh, chart showing the losses throughout the system is not showing is how much, how, how much of that high grade um, energy we're actually losing in the distribution in large buildings. And so we could add another huge percentage onto that uh, with our larger scale buildings. So on the left-hand side, what we are looking at basically is if we have climatic distributed resources, we're looking at really matching the potentials. So we have light, we'll keep light as light if it's coming into our building the way we want it. Right now, um, as I, I think Bess will show us later today, we really mismatch or we misuse our solar resource because the solar energy is not coming into our building in the way we need it. Usually it's not in the right direction, it's too much glare, it's too much heat. Um, it's going to unbalance the contrast ratio in our, in our rooms, et cetera. So we are basically turning on the lights when we do have um, a lot of ambient light. So the, f the first and most important thing that we would do within an integrated system is be able to use cool, diffuse um, um, uh, light. So separate basically the direct beam that's put, um, putting a lot of heat and glare into our space uh, from the diffuse beam. Um, then we also, obviously, we want to capitalize on that solar, uh, that, 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 that heat energy. If we, if we are looking at single function electrical systems, then we're basically wasting it. It's basically going into the ambient, and um, we're driving up our cooling loads potentially in various ways. It's certainly going to sink into the urban heat island. So if we can capture that and transform that quality, i.e. raise the temperature enough to be able to cascade that into various systems, that could then become um, useful to us. Um, so very much looking at, on the left-hand side, matching what types of ambient energy sources do we have for those applications. So if we actually start to look at that, what do we really, really need the electricity for? There are certain things that we might really need the electricity for, and we could take care of a lot of the other um, uh, uh, um, applications with um, uh, with by trading potentials, low grade potentials. So in our current systems, um, generally, you know, we're looking at very concentrated systems. Obviously, we have, um, uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm looking at the worst case scenario on the left hand side, but it is predominant still and prevalent. Um, and looking at how do we actually project um, onto capitalizing on those those sources and matching them um, with the least amount of losses. So we're really looking at that um, that it, those adjacencies. What that means, obviously, for combined heat and power, it's not just about um, uh, the solar conversion at the building envelope, but if we, at the building envelope, we are at least converting with the highest um, uh, efficiencies that we have. Right now, we're, we have um, uh, integrated systems efficiencies of over, uh, in the mid-30s, it's over 35%, actually, with our partners at Aminix. Um, then, if we look at ca uh, capturing the rest of that waste heat as high-quality heat, as concentrated heat, um, high temperature heat. If we look at emerging cell types, for instance, in, in indium gallium nitride, et cetera, they have heat tolerances uh, without any de degradation of the cell or of the system at between 150 and 180 C. That is the, 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 the temperature at which combined heat and power runs on nuclear submarines. So we're really talking potentially at very, very high temperatures. At case we're running our combined heat and power systems at 90 C and cascading from that, we still get a lot of work out of the system. So, but, but, but the other big story, of course, is DC microgrid, and very, very important, right, that we, if we say no photon wasted for the exist existing systems, 
if we can do as much as we can with the conversion, the storage, and the transformation at the building envelope within, um, uh, uh, within prefab units um, in building um, uh, uh, systems and curtain wall units, then if we can associate that with an adjacent DC microgrid um, in, uh, and uh, for LED lighting and for our, um, our various um, DC requirements, then we're really looking at being able to stretch those electrons very far into um, our different applications. So really it's that relationship between the facade and the interior um, uh, uh, modular unit that, um, that is critical with combined heat and power systems. Um, and so if we look at those numbers, um, we're really looking at um, numbers where we're able to capitalize on that resource uh, by stretching, by cascading, both uh, cascading the thermal um, uh, 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 potentials throughout um, uh, the first um, thing that we're doing actually in our facade units at CASE is we put uh, the high temperature heat into uh, sorption refrigeration cooling. Then the outlet temperature from sorption refrigeration cooling could potentially go into an organic writing cycle to boost up our electrical um, um, output. The outlet temperature from organic can go into domestic hot water, depending, or um, other types of um, um, maybe radiant heating, potentially. Uh, but ultimately, if we are, um, we're either distributing cool or we're distributing heat. And we have that choice from the facade into the adjacent um, um, uh, uh, capsule. Another important thing about this in terms of the end use energy demands um, is really, um, you know, if you look at all of those individual systems like organic Rankine cycles, heat to organic Rankine cycles to electrical production or sort of refrigeration cooling, in the old models, you can see BMOs like United Technologies and others have put a lot of energy into developing those systems, but they never added up as single function systems. If you, so we, we're capitalizing on a tremendous amount of knowledge about how to do that. Once you start to put that into an integrated system, those, those um, uh, uh, systems become very valuable because they are not in isolation and they are adding up to the, the, the overall uh, efficiency of the system. So of course then combined with radiant um, systems like chilled beams, et cetera. And if we are really gonna capitalize on the radiant systems um, uh, to um, capitalize on efficiencies in um, shifting temperatures, then other types of intelligent desiccated, uh, desiccation technologies uh, become really important. So um, folks like um, <coughs> Jack Horning, who we work with, um, we're, we're looking at how can we have chilled beams and other technologies that really can um, very viably and comfortably exist and switchably exist, basically, to deliver the kinds of comfort expectations that we have in extreme climates like New York, where we're dealing with the, the whole range of, 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 of conditions. Um, I don't know if I'm running, am I running out of time here? Yeah, okay, so I'm just gonna quickly, I'm not gonna go through all of these numbers, but you're more than welcome to come to CASE or um, read some of our, our things, but I would like to end then, this is um, our, some of our rigs that you can see we are basically um, uh, um, testing on ourselves. We are cooling our own space <laughs> with our um, uh, south-facing facade units in a very old building. So this is not, this is a deco building in New York City, this is not an optimal, um, condition, but if we were to retrofit, so this is a retrofit um, example in New York City with the um, uh, FIT south facing, this, this would be a, a north edition, and this is the only south facing uh, facade opportunity that they have in Midtown Manhattan. And underneath there is a winter garden that's uh, planned for the students. It's their only opportunity really to um, get a, a sort of hangout space. And you can see that they would have a tremendous solar heat gain problem if we just had existing systems. Uh, and really, so when we, when we talk about a system like this being synergistic, it's really looking at the passive and active flow. So we're taking the heat out of the system and converting it um, into a, um, uh, a, uh, a usable source. Um, so lowering the cooling loads, um, providing the diffuse, um, I don't think we'll have time for this next um, PSAT 2 uh, project, but basically lowering the cooling loads here in this space by intersecting taking out all of the direct beam, allowing the diffuse beam to flood into that space, and then providing the hot water for systems and providing the electricity for DC um, applications within um, that winter garden space. So basically, that adjacent space of the winter garden is directly associated and completely taken care of by uh, that clerestory expanse um, on the south face facade. Okay, thank you.